Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a, uh, this section of module one. Um, this is a recording that's independent of the Zoom meetings that I've had. I want to do a recap on the material that I presented this week and sort of refine it and make it a little bit better for you. So I'm going to push this meeting. So um, for those of you that have, have had the, the labs earlier in the week that have view, viewed a rendition of this uh, video al already, it will be very similar to what you've seen before. In some ways, I hope it is a better rendition. So we'll see what happens. Right, so I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen and have a look at the material we're dealing with right now. All right. So the purpose of the video, so of this video, um, at this point, of course, is sort of go over uh, two of the films which we've seen, you know, the, on your initial viewing list. The first one is Why Are We Here? That was narrated by Brian Cox. And the second one was Life's Rocky Start, which was narrated by uh, the author of your book you're reading, you know, The Story of Earth, Robert Hazen. Um, so in essence, the, the film that you're watching mirrors what's happening in the book. So when I'm talking about the, the film in the book, really, we're also talking about the book, too. So when we're thinking about the first film, Why Are We Here? You know, a lot of students have been, you know, like uh, perplexed about what the film was about. Well, some films, which are done, you know, really good films are always complicated. There's different layers of things happening. And you got to find out what the tagline is. The tagline on this one is about science, right? So right from the very beginning, he's always talking about ways of thinking, you know, right from the beginning when he was talking about the Brahmas, you know, the Brahma priesthood, priesthood, you know, uh, reaching in and utilizing basic principles of mathematics and a scientific sort of way of thinking. And where, you know, rudimentary thinking about what makes, uh, you know, creation, what it is to be alive, the nature of reality, over several hundred years has culminated into where he ended up in with the film, which was talking a little bit about the origin of reality itself, right? So he was really, you know, you know, you know touting praises to, to science. And that this is really what we need to do, too, is try to understand how science operates, because we are a scientific laboratory. And I wanted to give you a film to watch that was interesting, that was discussed science at the same time. Now, the title, of course, of the film, Why Are We Here?, you know, deals with this idea of multiverse, which are going to get to the end, but really, uh, why are we here is because of science. If you think about it, you know, the sort of quality of life that you have, the way that you live now, and even the way in which your parents have met and your grandparents have met, have been a product of science, because science, you know, um, is a way of thinking and producing, you know, knowledge and change the world has changed everything across the road for centuries, to the point where you wouldn't be here right now without science. Of course, it would be somebody else, most likely, but whoever they were would not be living at the same level that we live in now. It'd be for very primitive, probably back to horticulture or you know, primitive agriculture, right? So as far as you can see, you're seeing sort of the results of science. Of course, you know, I have my own favorite products of science. This phone here is, is like a second child. Of course, I have one child. I, I love this so dearly, but you know, um, this is another one here in a certain way because it enriches my life you know, in so many different ways. You know, we think about high technology and you know, we really don't think about what, how technology is produced, high technology, because it's, it's produced by scientific thinking. And that's what that film was about. So let's look at some of the points that, that Brian Cox was talking about that I really think brings, you know, science to life in ways that are interesting that pertain greatly into our anthropological investigation of human evolution. All right. So first is the statement he made. He said, there is order in everything. Indeed, there is. Sometimes the order just has to be found. And that order, you know, can be described in the language of mathematics. And that's exactly what he said. He said, Galileo described nature, right? Nature, everything in nature is written in the language of mathematics. Indeed it is. But here's the issue. That, that language is incredibly complicated. When we're looking at the movement of every particle and across the universe, and how those particles and matter fits together, right? The physics behind it, even the way that you think, right, is overwhelmingly complex, far beyond the ability for humans to, to build, you know, models, mathematical models to do it, not unless to do the simulations to make predictions. Thus, you know, the mathematics of it that we, we have so far that describe things are very limited, you know, and so if you look at what mathematics actually does, you know, we're really just looking at trying to get into the underlying that describe the complexity, how complexity is produced. Science doesn't get at the overwhelming complexity of the universe, the world, or even the, the human life because it's not possible, because it is too complex. Understanding the underlying rules of nature is critically important for humans. 
because this paves the way to greater knowledge and understanding of our own lives, right? And it also makes the world intelligible because really what he's tried to show you in this film is that complexity always emerges from an underlying simplicity. Think about some of the examples he was showing us. How about the meandering of the rivers, which I thought was very clever. Right? When you look at any river anywhere across the globe or in the visible universe, they all show a similar pattern, right? The ratio, or the, the meanders, the length of the meanders, the wavelength to the, the width, it was always between a certain ratio, no matter where we look. There's an underlying set of rules, right? An underlying pattern that's similar to that we can describe, that we can know something about the construction. We can make some predictions about rivers in which we find everywhere in the world, right? That's what science seeks to sort of explain. We're looking for patterns. Or we're actually looking for, you know, we see cause and effect relationships. So we see the effect of things all the time. You no, know? so certainly if I take a pair of glasses like this and throw them across the room, the effect of me throwing it causes the glasses to move. We're looking for we're looking for causes, but beyond the mere gaze, right? What, which is something mundane. You know, this 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 is not science. When you see me throw something, that's just visible. It's too mundane. What we're looking for are you know, clues to what causes something that are beyond the mere gaze, mere senses, right? Something beyond the ordinary that, that we can't rationally pick up with our own eyes. So we're asking questions and positing explanations and developing experiments that can test you know, reality to see if our version of reality, the cause of the effect is true or not. So we're asking very simple questions usually. It's a very humble pursuit. And we start with the simplest of things, right? We start with very simple things and see the relationship between the things, the hypothesis which you're producing and answering. And hopefully those hypotheses we keep building on each other so we can see a little greater complexity, a little greater levels of order. And that's what that film was about. We moved from things like the meandering of rivers, right? To the construction of reality and how it's actually produced. So science is, has, has made some great accomplishments because we, take this humble pursuit very seriously in the way in which we construct experiments that gain data, we are all data driven, and we only react or only proceed with data in which we have. We don't make assumptions about the world. Now, the thing about, that about science is it doesn't come naturally for humans, and that's the one of the things we wanna think about too, is that one of the approaches that Brian Koch is trying to show us is that there's you know, many different ways of thinking about the world. And many different ways will produce some sort of thoughts about what are causes and what the causes and effects. But if you're trying to understand what really happens, science is generally the only way to produce, to wheedle fact from actual fiction. Okay. Now, there's also other things happening in the film which are important to us. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, the arrival of our solar system, you know, the basis of life and how it becomes assembled. You know, there are some things within the film which I think are useful and very interesting. So let's see what I can do with those to help make intelligible to you. All right. So here we are, a basic model of the universe and how it began, you know, sort of one of these schematic sort of figures. And let's see how it relates to Brian Cox in the film, you know, why are we here? So, you know, here we're looking at a cone of time. So we go over to the left, we see the very beginnings of the universe and all the way to the right, here we are in contemporary times. And you notice in the bottom, it shows that's 13.77 billion years. Well, you know, there's some little bit of argument in the physics community is that 13.77 or is it 13.83 or anywhere in between? You know, what I, in, in all this sort of argument about those things and their models, let's just take an average and call it 13.8. I think that's really good, a little neutral point right now until things get hammered out very well and it makes that, that number easier for us to deal with. So let's say that 13.8 billion years ago, this whole thing started. And one thing to notice is that at the very beginnings are not the same at the ends, right? You can see some things have changed in the universe, right? Well, what things have changed that, that, that pertain to life, to us? You know, what are the things that really make us here? The anthropology of all this sort of stuff, right? So let's talk about what he was saying. What has experimental evidence found? All right, so we have the beginning, right? So most of you have heard, of course, from the TV show, where you hear these names like the Big Bang. Well, you know, what he's shown us is some evidence, you know, which, he, which, which is called the cosmic uh, microwave background image. Now let's locate that image on this diagram. 
Okay, so all the way over to the left, you see a little flat dish right there, and it's colored, and you see little you know, purples, you see some greens, some yellows, little red dots in there. Well, what that really is, right, that's visible light. At 375,000 years ago, light becomes visible, okay, right? If you're how and why. For that period of time, you know, the matter was very dense. The matter in the universe is very dense, a lot of gravity. You know, so much gravity, it would never release the light. The light can never release. You know, the light would try to leave and it would turn around and come back. It's like you're turning on your light bulb and there's so much gravity in the light bulb that the the light tries to get out of the light bulb, but it goes back in the light bulb will be dark. Same thing as a black hole. The early universe was an entire black hole. It was there. There was stuff there, but the gravity was too strong. So we really don't have, you know, any light from it. Well, at about 375,000 years ago, the gravity weakens and light begins to escape and floods the universe. Great. Well, at the time we are right now, over here on the right-hand side, we can actually see that light. It's coming into our detection. But that light has traveled literally 13.8 billion years from that period of time to reach our detectors. And it tells us that light is that old. And let's have a look at that light. Tell us what it tells about itself and the universe. So here you have that microwave background, that first light. Right. And it's quite large. I mean, that's a pretty big universe. You don't realize that that you couldn't even find the Earth in that with a pinhead. That would still be way too small. It would be even beyond electron microscope to find it so massive. Now, what that is, is actually a very uniform glow, which is exactly what Brian Cox said, which means the same temperature. Yes, you see the dark purples. Yes, you see the little brighter areas of red and yellow, but those aren't hot spots necessarily. We're talking about one ten millionth of a degree difference in temperature on that. Right, that's the sensitivity of microwaves. About the sense the the read the meters that collect this stuff. Right, it is almost exactly the same temperature everywhere we look at. So what this tells us, and there was no bang, that the universe, the bubble in itself, whatever it was, was was produced, and then what was in it, the energy in it, was instantly transformed into matter, and it all had the same temperature and same glow in one spot, and then. After it was established, time began, and then movement began, and then we have inflation. That's what he calls the inflationary theory of the universe. Like, okay, there's, there's the, sort of the mechanical modern, right? modern. So what does that mean for us? That's the big thing and reality. Well, Brian Cox was trying to tell us that this hasn't happened once. It's a continual thing. But the big energy itself, which is out of time, it's a, a different type of energy. It's constantly shifting and changing, reaches below certain trough points, you know, creating bubbles, which convert into matter. And then that matter does that, bam, converts to instant energy, right? And matter, and then it begins to expand. It's constantly doing this up and down, up and down. Universes are constantly being created. Okay? Well, what he doesn't tell you really is this because he doesn't have the time and maybe it wouldn't be intelligible, so I'll try has to do a lot with time. Here's the thing. Where is the past? Where is the future? You see, as you're living right now, you're moving forward. There is no past. It's gone. That's empty space now. It's only a memory. It doesn't exist except for in your head. The thing about the future is something. And as soon as you occupy it, whatever is in it can't be there. It has to move forward. And that's where the other universes are. They're ahead of us and behind us in time. As these bubbles begin their journeys, they erupt in time. Another one comes right behind it, erupts in the space it was in as it moves forward. The other one flowing, another one comes in behind it, another one, and another. All the way into the future, forever and ever, and it will continue all the way forever and ever. There is no beginning and there is no end. That's the fascinating thing about it. And interesting thing too is with all these millions and infinite, infinite numbers of universes, there is the possibility that the constants of nature are different in each of them. They may not be, they may be all the same, we don't know. What we do know is the constants of nature, the speed of light, you know, the gravity and all the other things have made our universe 
a place which can be very hostile in some ways, but also a way, a universe in which you know, life is possible too. The speed of gravity, the strength, the, uh, the, 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 the strength of gravity and, and the speed of light are perfect for the formation of things like oxygen, right? The oxygen couldn't exist if it wasn't for the exact constants of nature. Most of the, the, the ingredients we have here for life couldn't exist unless you know, the constants of nature were the way they were. Now, it also is a possibility that other universes in the multi-universe have different sort of constants. And many universes probably have the same constants because, as he was saying, we're dealing with most li the likelihood of infinite number. That means infinite. With infinite, you mean infinite choices, right? And it does give the possibility that there are infinite copies of you and me. I hope, and also universes where things might have slightly different evolutionary histories, to where you know uh, the individual characters, even your own lives, play play out slightly differently. You know, I always think that too. Maybe maybe, maybe I love that Denzel Washington. That would be so awesome. That guy's so handsome. He's my age too, right? So it's possibly I'd be better in other universes. Well, there's some science fiction built into that, obviously, and and, and of course, you know, there's scientific scientific movies that are science fiction movies that play off this whole thing. But there is that reality, too, that, that these universes are very close together. And we can see that in black holes. We're really understand what the information is, is that black holes are areas in where there's so much gravitational force, that things shrink, that things are under so much gravitational containment, that it slows matter down and it slows time down. And when that happens, it, the universes come together, they touch each other, and then wormholes, right? Little holes exist in which you, in which, um, black holes will actually connect um, universes together. Um, and, um, you know, this is some of the stuff that's, you know, in science, science fiction literature and all that sort of stuff that we don't want to go into in this class, but it's all fun to think about, right? But back to Brian Cox. Thus, if we're living in a multi-universe, life, you know, the, the, the odds of life happening, are, it's like winning a lottery ticket, right? With an infinite number of universes, this is like, you know, which lottery ticket is yours? Which universe is yours? Someone has got to win that ticket. And in some universe, there has to be life. Well, at least in our universe, there is, and we're here to actually prove it. Okay, so that's the big take home for, for, for that. Now let's get into, you know, what happens after the universe sort of unfolds and, and our earth is established and where does life begin and what does it take to begin? That's the really important issue. So, Okay. All right. Uh, one thing we got to look at is this. I know you guys are cringing. Oh my God, that's like chemistry. It's not chemistry. Chemistry is about how all that stuff puts together and how it works and all sorts of stuff. We're not going to do any of that stuff, right? What you're looking at um, is really just a, a different view of that. That, you know, is another like view of like the universe, right? Some sort of, you know, model of it. And that's what that is too. It's called the periodic table of, of elements. That's everything in the universe. And if you put those things together in different combination, it makes everything out there and in here too, because there's nothing not in there in you, and there's nothing in you that's not in there. So you are a physical structure like everything else in the universe. And it was kind of reductionist, right? But humans re want to resist reductionism because we want to be bigger than we are. Sorry, you know, the exploration of human life and reality sometimes can be a humbling pursuit. And sometimes I think it's a very healthy pursuit. Now, when we look at this, we had to make some meaning about what's going on here. Okay, so you see 103 different things, possible things. It's the, all the things that's possible in the universe. That's it, that's everything, just in different combinations. Now, the reality is anything above number 95, right, Amer Americium is really not going to happen. Normally up to like number 94, that's about it. The rest of them are around every once in a while. There's some freak conditions, you know, that normally they just spontaneously decay and they're gone, right? So 94 things makes everything else. Well, what do we see of ourselves in there? I think that's important. You know, it's not chemistry, but what do we see of ourselves? How can we identify this stuff? Right. Well, I can identify first with number six. Number six is carbon. There's a lot. Of, we, we hear the thing we're carbon-based organisms. A lot of carbon in humans. You know, all of life. Right. Number six. There it is. A lot of carbon in everything else. Right. I can pick up my pencil. I can look at the end, which is made of you know graphite. That's almost pure carbon. I share a lot of the same carbon right in my pencil. The difference between me and the pencil is depending on how I combine carbon with all the other elements. That's it. 
right? Determines how life is made or not. Of course, people would have the arguing differently, like Mercer, you are a pencil. No, don't do that, right? So my, my kid does that all the time, no. So um, we think about it, you know, trying to tease out the differences between, you know, a, a life, form of life and the rest of the, the inorganic part of the universe, you know, can be, can be kind of tricky when you boil it down to things like this, right? It can be. But I think it's pretty interesting so we can see how similar we are to the rest of the universe, how we are together. Let's, let's look at some of the other things that are in this. We got nitrogen, you know, like the proteins and stuff, the nucleic acids, and, you know, amino acids are made of a lot of nitrogen, number seven. We're just going to write the line there. Oxygen too, a lot of oxygen in the stuff that I've got, even with water, right? So to make water, we take one oxygen, number eight, and we take two hydrogens, like two number one, put them together and you got water. That's 70% of who you are. So right there, I've got like 85 to 90% of me just sitting there between number one, six, seven, and eight. Wow. What else is in me? And you can identify with. Well, I can see number 26. There's some iron. You have to have iron. You have iron poor blood. You've heard about that, right? Iron helps facilitate the transfer of oxygen. I got some calcium, number 20, lots of calcium is in my bones, right? Um, I also have a lot of potassium, right, in my bones too. So there's potassium in there, which is number 19. That's the K is a weird sign. They have Ks, right? Potassium. And we have table salt, right? We call it sodium chloride, a lot of that stuff. So there's sodium, and that should be number 11. And I have chlorine, number 17. You put them together to make salt. I got that in me. What else is there? I got some zinc, number 30 is a valuable cofactor. So you look at how I'm identifying the human, you know, a lot in these building blocks. And that has a lot to do with how science works, right? We're looking at the underlying rules that sort of lend to complexity. And really that's what chemistry does too. People think chemists do all sorts of complex things, but it really is a humble pursuit. You know, trying to look at the basic building blocks, how the simple things yield complexity. What are the underlying rules to this? Now, in the, in the scope of this class, we're not looking at any of the underlying rules of chemistry. We're trying to find what the underlying rules of natural selection. You know, the five basic tenets are rule in our scorecard. But basically, all science works the same way. So that's why we're always doing very simple things like that. But even in here, it's helpful for us. What else can we talk about? Well. Let's talk about the arrival of life and how it was possible and how we can see it through something like this and the universe itself. Now, when the early universe was formed, let's go back to that little, that little slide I had up here, okay? Way back in the very beginning. So you see, you know, before 375,000 years ago, and it says quantum fluctuations and then finally inflation, right? And it's just kind of bright light. There's, there's, no, there's no stars, right? You notice that there's no stars until like 400 million years ago. So what was there? I mean, what was really happening? You know, at the time of this first light. Well, here's the thing. There's really only one thing in the entire universe. One building block. And that's number one. Right up there on the top left-hand corner. That was it. Hydrogen. That was it. Gas clouds of hydrogen as far as you can see. You're probably dead. You wouldn't see this cold iciness of space would kill you instantly, right? Or fry you because it was really hot back then. So what happened? When things begin to cool, you know, and that plasma condenses down, the first elements that we see, the only element we see is hydrogen. And it's just gas clouds doing nothing, right? When we go back to this uh, little diagram here, in about 400 million years, things start cooling down enough that they, that the, they're not vibrating so fast and bouncing off each other. The hydrogen begins to you know, attract each other under their own gravitational sort of you know, influence. Like you drop this pencil here, it falls. It's because the gravitational influence of this, the mass of this is attracting the earth, right? That's really what it is, the gravity attracting each other, right? And that's what happens to individual modules of, of molecules of hydrogen. And they begin to get more and more and more and stack on top of each other into the big balls of hydrogen and lots of pressure on the inside. There's so much pressure on the inside that the hydrogen squeezes together. And you know, what's one plus one? Two. What's number two? Helium. See, that's how simple the chart is. All you got to do is put two hydrogens together and you have helium. That's what happens in stars. That's called fusion, things fuse together. 
And of course, that liberates energy. It makes things hot when you do that, but it does make helium, right? So what happens when you take two plus one? What's the number comes together? So one plus two is three, right? So all you really need to do is add one more hydrogen to helium, and then you get number three lithium. Well, how do you get number four beryllium? Well, you just add one hydrogen to lithium because one plus three is four. Well, how do you get boron number five? Well, you just need to add one hydrogen to beryllium. Four plus one is five. You see how interesting that is? To get all the other elements, all you have to do is keep adding a hydrogen to what was right before and you make the other element. So what happens is when these gas clouds get together in stars, the temperature and pressure inside the stars is great enough that they're able to force hydrogen one by one, creating heavier and heavier elements. It's very interesting. It's very simple. It's so stupid simple, right? I wish, I wish my life made as, as much sense as the universe did. Well, here's the thing. What are the limitations of all this sort of stuff? Does it keep going all the way up till we have number 103? Depends. Now, our little star is a little star. I'm a little embarrassed with our star. I think when there's intelligent life someday and they get here, we're going to have bad luck because they're going to have a bigger star to flaunt than ours. Chances are, for those of you that know about astronomy, ours isn't very, we have, we have a thing called a main sequence star, right? But, you know, our star has enough temperature and pressure in it to assemble, you know, add hydrogen to everything behind it to build up to number 26. And that's the one right in the center with a little red triangle I put around it, iron, iron. So when our little star dies, it will in like 15 billion years, all it's gonna be left a little iron core. That's it, that's it, right? Well, here's the thing. If you look on earth, we have, you know, regularly things all the way up to like number 94. So if our star could only produce up to number 26, where do the heavier elements come from? Let's think. Let's go back to our, our little thing here, okay? So the first stars began to form 400 million years ago. The first ones. Well, you know what? We've got another roughly 13 billion years to go to get to us. So let's see what happens to some of those first stars when they begin. Now, I mentioned that our star is very, very small. Let's see how small it actually is compared to other stars. Here we go. Okay. So here's our sun, our noble sun. I love our sun. Um, over here on the upper left hand, it's our little orange sun up there. All right, now there's Sirius. So um, you could fit roughly two and a half of our suns inside Sirius. And Sirius is up in the sky over in the Southwest. You could probably see it right now. It's blue, it grows blue, right? Well, we have another type of star um, and there's a, like a red giant here and it's Pollux, right? So roughly you can put about maybe 80 to 90 Earths inside of Pollux. Okay, there's another size. So 90 times the size of our sun, Pollux. Okay. Let's go up to a red supergiant, right? So Arcturus. You could probably put a thousand of our suns inside Arcturus. That's like a red supergiant, right? Now you watch. You see the whole lower portion of the slide here? That's just not artwork. That's a sun down there. That's UY Scotty, okay? The radius of that star is 1,700 times greater than the radius of our sun. You could put just about 1 million of our suns inside of that thing. That's how big it is. That's a red hypergiant. These things are enormous. Could you imagine what type of temperature and pressure is occurring in that star? And especially when that star blows up. When they get big like this, they're a little unstable. Now, our sun's gonna last a long time, like 15 billion years. We're just started with our star, very stable. I like our star. Burns, you know, it's hydrogen, converts it to helium very slowly, very appropriately. Not like these big ones. You know, the brighter the star, you know, the faster the life or whatever it is, you know, how about that adage is, right? But that's what's going to happen. Very short periods of time, these things do blow up. And when they do, all that temperature and pressure just keeps adding one more building block to hydrogen, everything to we get a big gamut of all the heavier elements. So here's, here's like a, when I'm going a supernova right now, just a year, excuse me, just a year ago, 
SN20, uh, 201 APS, this is a, it's a catalog number for a star, uh, went supernova. Massive explosion, right? That is like 100,000 light years across. That's how far you can go you know, in a year, 100,000 years, right, in light, right? And by the way, light will travel around the Earth about nine times in one second. Could you imagine the distance? It's how huge these things are. But what you can see is very important is on the outside, like the halo. halo. You see the gas clouds there? That's just vaporized material that was inside of the star. That's all the heavier elements out there. And there is when the star is finished blowing up and you have this super hot, you know, gas cloud that's left. And all those different colors represent all those different elements in the periodic table, way past iron, all the way, you know, to the heavier elements down here, like, you know, plutonium, which we find in our planet. Of course, things like Lorentzium number 103 are formed like during the blowing up process. But as soon as all that stuff's over and it's cooled over, Lorentzium and all those big, heavy, exotic things just fade away. You know, they, they, they revert back to smaller things. But here's the thing. All of those things up in 94 are found on our Earth. So it tells us something about Earth, that we came from that. That formerly what was here was a gigantic star that went supernova. And then that gas cloud began like this. And then under its own gravity began to collapse, as we're seeing here. The gas cloud and slide number one at the top begins to come together. And what happens with gas clouds is they begin to spin, very much like if you had a round sink and you pull the drain stopper and you'll watch the water spinning, right? That's really what happens. There's, a, there's some physics in that where, you know, conserve conservation of energy and momentum. There's some, if you take physics, you'll find it, but you don't need to know that. You need to know it spins, right? As it spins, it begins to flatten out and they have a term for this and Hazen calls it an accretion disk, a fancy term, which just means that when it spins, it gets flat. And here's what happens is that because there's gravity involved, you know, the stuff with more mass gets drawn towards the middle, the heavier stuff, like the heavier material, right? And what I mean by heavier, the big stuff, right? So we can see things like, you know, we've got like, like iron, you know, platinum and gold, which we have on Earth. Now gold over here, number 79. We have mercury, number 81. We have lead, number 82. All these things, all the heavier things get drawn towards the center. And those heavier objects begin to attract each other under their own gravity. And they begin to pile up together in balls and those balls become planets. So the Stuff close to the sun has a lot of heavy stuff in it, and we call those rocky planets. So we have four rocky planets, right? Mer you don't have to know this stuff. This is like just to let you know. It's, uh, the, the one closest to the sun, very close, is Mercury. Then we have Mars, right? Then Earth, then Venus. All these are rocky. We're like the third rock from the sun, just the perfect spot where water is kept in the perfect condition for life. Well, outside in the creation disk are the lighter elements. So we go back to our chart here. We can see all oh, the lighter stuff like hydrogen gases, fluorine, all these you know, light gases are out there, the lighter stuff. And those things just, the gases just kind of freeze and they're giant gas balls, literally. So when we look at the planets that are on the outside of the solar system, they're gigantic, but they're just basically gas balls, although they all they are, right? The gaseous planets. Well, this process right here is typical all over the universe. This is happening all the time. We're nothing special, right? What makes us special, I think, is the size of our Earth and its distance from the sun and the right type of sun in which we have. Because we live in a universe with constants that were just perfect, right? And just the right conditions for this to occur, which life to have happen. So in many ways, I have to tell you that we are rare and special. And uh, how many other you know, solar systems like this are with our own universe, we don't know. We might be the only one. But for certainly across the multi-universes, there is something else. But of course, the sad thing is we'll probably never know unless one of you young whiz kids finds a way that we can experimentally detect you know, other universes and other civilizations. But I think that's a long way off in the future. Let's move on to see how, you know, life gets established on our planet and what those first forms were life and then how that trajectory is sort of leading to us. Okay. Um, so, um, think about is, you know, life in itself, you know, 
where does it begin? How does it begin? Well, you know, if the earth is first forming, and if you read, you know, Hazen's book, what he does, or his films, he tries to break down the evolution of Earth and, and the changes to color phases, which I think is, you know, really smart if you do that. I think it's very simplified, but I think it's effective. Let's think about the very first phase in which Hazen is talking about, which is the black phase of Earth. And what he really means by this is not just when it begins, but he really talks about the, the mineral constituency. What were the rocks like? Well, everything was homogeneous. The rocks were the same, all mixed up. All the minerals, the, 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 the chemical agents here on Earth were mixed up in a homogeneous, you know, sort of cake mix, all the same thing, and had one look. And that was sort of a black look. The Earth was black. And this time, the, universe, the, the solar system is very young. We're being hit by all sorts of stuff, lots of loose rocks flowing around the universe. I mean, sorry, our, our solar system. A lot of meteor impacts, which kept it hot for a very long time. And in fact, just 50 million years after the initial formation of our planet, there was another planet, another smaller planet in our orbital path that we attracted and it glazed off Earth. And it took a piece of Earth off us and that formed the moon. So the, the moon is actually resulting of an impact, which we'll look at in a little bit. And that that glazing of Theia knocked it off, off to the corner and the trajectory sent it out of the solar system, thank God, so it's not, in our or it's not in our orbit anymore, which is really good for us, right? So, you know, we get to this, this phase in which you know, everything's homogeneous, you know, black Earth, the, the moon's up there. And then what happens is, is the rocks begin to separate. They're very hot. And they begin to separate on density. Now, for instance, so you have a, you know, a glass of water and you drop an ice cube in it. You notice that the ice cube doesn't drop to the bottom it rises to the top because it's less dense. You know, because frozen ice expands a little bit, you know, and when it does, it makes it less dense and it floats to the top. Well, the same principle is happening on Earth. The heavier stuff begins to sink slowly to the bottom and the lighter rocks begin to come to the top. The lighter rocks are lighter color, almost a gray color. And when that happens over time, the Earth begins to have more of a gray look on it, less black and more gray. And we enter Hazen's gray phase of Earth. Well, what's very interesting about that, more than just the continents begin to get formed, is that when the rocks begin to separate, there are chemical reactions that obviously happen as rocks are separate, separating. And part of the things that happen in the chemical reactions are the precipitation of water. Water is one of the byproducts of this. So surface water begins to form all over the Earth. We do get some contributions that we think are coming in from comets. They are non-rocky things that hit us. These are just gas balls made with a lot of gases and water. And they're contributing to the, the water you know, uptake of Earth. And then we enter Earth's blue phase. The gray phase is will, still with us. Now we still have continents. You can still see some gray out there, right? But we also are getting more blue because of water. Now this is what we're interested in because this is where in which, you know, life is able to form. This is the conditions necessary. Now, a lot of folks were thinking that maybe, you know, in Earth's early atmosphere, that potentially there was reactions that could have happened that could have produced life. No, it's not going to happen. There were reactions in the atmosphere that can produce the raw materials for life. And we'll look for that in just a moment. Before I go into that, let's think about why not the atmosphere. Simple. At that time, there was no ozone, no layer up there that helps obliterate the really harmful radiation from the sun, like high intensity UV that would just scorch you in five minutes, right? That type of high radiation would just basically, you know, I mean, sterilize the atmosphere, any, you know, attempt of life to begin with it. So the atmosphere is not good. Can it actually be brought in by, by meteorites? Is it possible? No. The impact of meteorites is incredibly violent, like 1,500 miles per second. Everything is completely vaporized down to its bare atomic. The little building blocks themselves are the only thing left, right? But a lot of those things are important ingredients that we get to add to the formation of organic molecules. So meteorites can bring in raw material for life, but not life itself. That, that's out of the question. What we're thinking about are chemical reactions near or within what we call deep sea vents. We call these hydrothermal vents. Now, these are discussed a lot by 
by Hazen. In both, Lice Rocky started in his book, but I'll get more into the details here to explain those processes in case he didn't make sense for you. All right. So let's go to the first one, the atmosphere. So what do we know about the atmosphere? Well, Stanley Miller, Roger Urey, that's his graduate student, Urey, they were doing some experiments back in the 1950s. And during this period of time, geologists had produced information about what the early atmosphere was like. And we knew it contained methane, which is like cow farts, right? Cow farts, CH4. And we knew it claimed ammonia. If you open up like a bottle of ammonia, you do a cleaning with, sniff it, that's ammonia, right? And we had some hydrogen. That's the stuff they filled, you know, early dirigibles with like the Hindenburg, which blow up, right? So we have methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, and no oxygen. No oxygen. It's not the same atmosphere we have now. Very corrosive, very violent sort of cocktail, noxious. And we did have water in the ocean, so we have H2O. So they simulate the situation. They have a flask with the ocean water, H2O, that seawater with all its salts. They heat it up like it would be heated up by the sun and it evaporates. The water vapor rises. It mixes with the upper atmosphere with all that methane, all that ammonia and hydrogen gas. Then they apply something that's in the Earth's atmosphere now and in the past, electricity. In the past, it was through electrical storms and lightning. And what they're going to simulate with an electrode and zap it with the same sort of force, high current. And they just watch what happens. Right? What begins to happen are the water and the collection. You know, when it begins to rain down the condensation, it turns pink. And they are really excited because they do an analysis of that. And they find out all sorts of organic compounds. And really what organic means is chemistry, but we don't worry too much about it. It just means when you take things like, you know, uh, methane, CH4, and you break it down and you just put carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen chains. You start putting carbon together in chains with hydrogens off of it, right? You start putting that stuff together. And that stuff is the backbone of many of the molecules in your body. And particularly is what makes fats and lipids and all the things that make you soft and pliable. It's making the precursors of life, not life itself. Well, what else is happening in here? Well, we find that the nitrogen, the N groups, right, what we see on the ammonia, are coming together with hydrogen and water in a way, which are making amino acids. These are the building blocks of the proteins on you know, your hair and everything over your body, your skin, the collagens and all these things. It's making all the rudimentary proteins necessary to build life, all of them. The last missing ingredient will be the instructions for life, you know, how it should occur, you know, and maintain itself and grow and reproduce. It certainly wasn't made in the other upper atmosphere. You know, we got some of the basic materials, but we found out later. Um, by examining clays and muds. We never thought such a thing would be possible by looking at clays and muds, which are, seem like they're icky and just squishy, but they're highly complex surfaces where lots of chemistry happens, right? But some of that chemistry is elegant and can produce a master molecule, which is used to provide the instruction sets for life to reproduce and grow. And that molecule is RNA. Many organisms use just RNA for growth and development. Now we use RNA, but we also use DNA very close relative to it. But what you need first is RNA. So just some precursory sort of looks at these clays. You know, we've seen that right now we see strands of them growing. They're short strands, they're only 100 bases. But we realize that you know, statistically, these clays can produce much longer ones, thousands and thousands and thousands of bases long, and all sorts of varieties of them with all sorts of different instruction sets, you know, almost infinite number of copies of these things right, that can be supplied to the early ingredients of all the other compounds. And that can, could produce life under the right circumstances. Now, our job is to see, you know, uh, what sort of circumstances could actually bring those assemblies together to create the first life on Earth? Well, once again, it's not going to happen in the early atmosphere. It's not going to happen on land. Land for the same reason, too much solar radiation. It's going to cause sterilization. Now, shallow ponds, we thought maybe life could happen in shallow ponds. Maybe, but here's the thing, is that shallow ponds are sort of an open sort of environment. 
there's nothing really there to concentrate organic molecules, nothing there to provide an energy source, except for the pond itself, and particularly a lot of UV radiation can penetrate shallow water and cause a lot of damage, so most likely sterilization would occur too. What we have found is in deep oceans, you know, deeper oceans, at the very bottom, a lot of, you know, hydrothermal vents, a lot of energy from the lower crust of the earth, called the mantle, that black rock that's still hot, right, is in contact with seawater. And, and it actually boils it and forms like little like geysers underneath the ocean. And these create these vents. And today when we're exploring these vents, we find life living in incredibly harsh conditions. Um, these forms of life, these single cell lives, we call extremophiles. There's many different types that can live, you know, in the Arctic when it's frozen, right? They can almost live in outer space, you know. But the ones that live in these hydrothermal vents, we refer to them as thermophiles which show us and demonstrate to us that yes, life can live under extreme conditions in hydrothermal vents. So absolutely the first life could be forming within these structures, but we need to investigate them a little further before you know, so we can convince ourselves that this whole thing is actually possible. So a picture of what we're looking at, a hydrothermal vent. Now the thing about it is on the surface, it seems like, you know, all of the hot, you know, superheated water that's moving through the hydrothermal vents. And by the way, this is bringing up a lot of minerals that precipitate on the outside and keep building thermal vent. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. Some of these things are you know, six to eight stories high, right? And it seems like all the hot water, look how black that water is, right? Full of organic compounds. Even the RNAs are in there. All sorts of minerals are in there just packed together. It seems like they're all coming on the top of the vent. They're those vents are riddled with billions and billions and billions of tiny little pore spaces, little crevices in which the water is flowing through. And you can feel on the outside of the vents, you can feel the water moving through, not just the top, but on the outsides. And it's in those little pores where all those organic compounds are concentrating. And this is where the chemistry of life is happening. Okay, all right. So a sort of a diagram of what we're talking about. Yeah, you know, we have the RNAs and the muds, you know, being produced around the vents. The stuff coming down from the atmosphere, nucleic acids and long chain fatty acids, the hydrocarbons, you know, these, these organic molecule chains coming down. And as they move down to the ocean, they get pulled into the sands, you know, they get pulled in as cold water then forced into the vents and they superheat, they travel upwards. And they move out of the vent, up in the top of the vent and they recirculate back down again, right back to the soils. So it's just recirculating all of these organic molecules up and down. Now, the thing about it is, is today on Earth, we have a few square miles of these vents. Now, in the early Earth, we're talking about millions of square miles of these. This was most all the ocean floors were full of these. Think about the odds of life evolving or create, being created. When you have millions of square miles of this, this is going on 24 hours a day packed with all the right ingredients. What we need is a precursor, some sort of cell structure to begin it. And we have found it. Let's have a look. So one of the things about hydrocarbon, these molecules, these CHs, when you put them together, what they produce are fats. And if you drop a drop of fat in water, you'll notice it makes a little round ball, a little cell, a little like little hollow ball. And it's really what they do. And especially if you mix them with a little bit of phosphates, they can make structures that are very similar to your cell membranes, right? That's why you're squishy. Well, most of you are, well, I'm, I'm more squishy than you because I'm older than you guys, but most of you struggle squishy. That's what makes you alive. Your cells are flexible and pliable, 15 trillion of them. Because all 15 trillion have this sort of fatty membrane on the outside. That's how life has to start. Then we fill it with the stuff that makes it active and alive. Well. What's interesting about it is that the stuff that was right there in the atmosphere sphere being made automatically forms little these droplets, like little primitive little membranes. And when these droplets get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know what they do? They automatically split in half to create daughter cells. And as those daughter cells get too big, they split in half. So, you know, they're reproducing themselves, of course, is without life. This is completely something that has no life in it. But these things are beginning to occupy these hydrothermal vents. They're in the small spaces. 
a way to be charged with all the organic molecules, you know, and the life programming molecule, the RNA. It's just waiting for the right combination of RNA made by the clay so that those cells can actually become active. So everything's there and waiting for it. We just need one more thing. We need an energy source. You know, despite these hydrothermal cells you know, pouring water through it, which we could, you know, with all our technology, you know, sort of harness the energy in some geothermal sort of way, that's not how life works. Well, think about how we're powered. You know, we don't think about it very often, but because, you know, we think about the mundane things, which are important, eating, you know, we eat food, but ultimately what happens to it? We take the complex, you know, molecules and we break them down. And what we're doing is we're releasing chemical energy and transforming into electrical energy. That's what's happening. You and I both put out enough energy to light up about a 150 watt light bulb. Of course, Cardi B even more. I love her. She's so much energy to her, you know, she probably puts out 300 watts. I love that, right? But, but yeah, you know, a lot of electrical energy, a current actually is produced. And that's what we do. We actually take food and break it down to currents. So we run on electricity. All life does as far as the world can see, no matter which, you know, life you're looking at needs that. That's what we call the spark. Literally, it's an electrical current. So you need to have an electrical current there. You have one. What's interesting is that, you know, another name for these vents, it's not just hydrothermal, they're also called alkaline vents. And what that means is that the early ocean water was very acidic, you know, acid-like, but the conditions inside the vent were very basic, not acid, anti-acid, right? And what happens is when you have a, an acidic environment next to a basic environment, it creates a current, an electric current will flow. So we have electricity flowing through the hydrothermal vents, through those little passageways across all of those fatty little droplets filled with organic compounds, supplying a constant and pretty good voltage, you know, for, for as long as they need, you know, for millions of years consistently. And that's when we get what we need to have life. The organic molecules, all of them together with a constant energy source. And then we have a constant source of nutrients continually be replenished from the vent for the cells, the new cells, and a constant source of energy, the electric current. So literally the first life is feeding on the energy provided by the earth. Dagiotisosis, the eating of other organisms hasn't even begun yet. All energy is coming from the mother. And I know it's kind of a cliche to say the earth is a mother, but in scientific terms, I got it nailed right here. I think we do as scientists, right? And I'm really proud of that. All right. So um, one of the most interesting things about this is like, yeah, we have life. You know, it's starting in hydrothermal vents, but life must escape this environment. Now, here's the thing is that we have no answers about this yet. We know that it did. We have evidence that it did. How it did, we don't know. And how it escaped is by sh simply shifting energy sources. No longer are we relying on those electrochemical gradients between the pH differences across the from the water to the, the alkaline vents to get electricity. We're beginning to, well, our early life is beginning to get its energy from the sun through photosynthesis. The first single cell plants, right, evolve and remove themselves from the, the source of the mother. They, they literally fly the nest. How that occurred, we don't know. But that it occurred, we are certain of by the evidence that we have from the past. Just look at that evidence and exactly what was presented in Lies Rocky Star. Okay. All right. So um, we know about the extremophiles in which they exist. They're all over the place. I love this one. It's really dangerous. Anthrax, you know, little organism. That thing is so brutal. I mean, you can take all the water, you can desiccate it, dry it to death. You can put it under huge extreme heat, cold. You can try to dump poison on it. And even Space Lab took it and put it in the space for a while and brought it back and find out it still lives. See, it's hard to kill these things so that we know that life can thrive and be built and created under extremely harsh conditions because we have examples of it today. So let's go on and talk a little bit about how, uh, what evidence we have about life freeing itself and how life will go through another color phase and that will end this lecture for today. Okay. So the Earth's atmosphere to this period of time has no oxygen in it, but soon it will. What happens is that life frees itself from Earth and begins to use energy from the sun. 
to take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, put carbon dioxide together to create sugars, and then take those sugars and break them down and convert that energy into electrical energy, which powers the plant and builds its structures. But what happens is, is when the plant is tearing down the sugars for food, the byproduct of that is oxygen. Plants liberate oxygen. They take in CO2 and liberate oxygen. And they're liberating oxygen to the atmosphere for the very first time. Now, oxygen to us, you know, it's sort of like it's oxygen everywhere around. We're used to it. We're, we're evolved uh, to be in a, you know, an environment which is fairly oxygen rich. You know, the thing about it is the early earth had never seen oxygen before, and oxygen is potent. If you ever heard this term, it's an oxidizer. Well, oxygen is the thing that just tears molecules apart. It's it's a little devil. It changes everything. It recombines with minerals. It makes new minerals. It changes everything. And what it did for the first time was, is a lot of just free building blocks of stuff floating around the ocean, like iron, just happy iron floating around out there. And all of a sudden plants start releasing oxygen. The oxygen attacks iron, combines with iron, and makes something called iron oxide, a completely different chemical. It begins to glump together and it sinks right to the bottom of the ocean. It precipitates out. And um, we've seen it. And those things called banded iron formations. And some of those primitive rocks on Earth, like in Australia, and the deep canyons where we go back in time, back to the, the beginnings of this, we see you know, things literally miles thick of rusted iron. And those date to the exact time in which we find early evidence for the very first photosynthetic organisms. They're colonies of bacteria living together. And they actually produce structures which are called stromatolites. That's not the name of the creatures, that's the structures they produce. See those little things out there on the left-hand picture? Those are stromatolites. They're like people that, uh, my students have said, but that looks like dinosaur poop. Well, actually it totally does, right? But they're, they're not. Uh, what happens is, is that the um, ancestors of those are on the top or on the bottom. They start by building, living, and then when they die, their you know, descendants build on top and live on top, and when they die, they're descendants. So this is just colonies of bacteria. And you can imagine you know, several hundred thousand years go by, and they build these structures called stomatolites, only the living stuff's on the outside. And we were able to date these things. So the, um, some, the average date's 3.5 billion years, but some extend back to 3.2 billion years. So it tells us that life had freed itself from these, you know, hydrothermal alkali vents by at least by 3.2 billion years, enriching the atmosphere with oxygen. And now we're moving in the direction where we're going to start moving from plant life into animal life. And our job is really to check, you know, when animal life arrives, which animal life becomes us. And that really the exciting part begins, and we begin to track our trajectory from those points. But for right now, I want you to get through the red earth, right? It's where we're at, because when this banded iron formations begin to form up, there is a red twinge to Earth. Earth, you know, Earth begins to add an additional color. And Hazen pronounces that red Earth. Now, was the entire Earth red? No, that's a really hyper exaggeration because you're still going to see blue oceans. You're still going to see the great continents, right? But you're going to see some red areas at the bottom of some of these seas as the iron precipitates out for a while. It's going to give it that twinge, and you would be able to see something like that. So by saying the entire Earth turned red, that would be a bit of a hyperbole. I want you guys to sort of understand that, right? It wasn't that dramatic. All right. And the last thing I want to say to sort of conclude the lecture, to bring everything home, is that when oxygen hits the atmosphere, something interesting happens that when Earth begins to form, you know, it's really very simple. There aren't that many minerals in you know, combinations of those building blocks to create little rocks around. It's like 200. That's it. Now, the Earth today has 5,000 minerals on it. A big mystery is that how do you go from 200 minerals to 5,000 minerals? And what were the agents that caused this change? Well, we're looking at one right here, life. When life begins to produce oxygen, that oxygen combines with all sorts of minerals in different ways, gets in the rock cycle, and completes thousands of new minerals. They're literally within just a few hundred million years. We increase the complexity of minerals and rocks on Earth dramatically. And one of the limiting factors about, about, about minerals are that they limit the complexity of life, too. 
you know, the more complex minerals become, the more complex forms of life we can have. So in a sense, life gives an agent to Earth to increase its complexity so we can have more complex life. And as we're going to see too, as more complex life lives and dies and returns back to the rock cycle, as we say ashes to ashes, we reinculcate back into the rock cycle, giving even more complex rocks, even more complex minerals, more complex soils that give rise to even more complex organisms. So indeed, the story of the complexity of life is also the unfolding complexity of the earth. And what I call an interesting, you know, co-evolutionary strategy, right? A symbiotic sort of relationship where inorganic meets organic and an interesting sort of dependency. All right, so I want you guys to get started and make sure you get the redder. And here in this module, really what we're trying to do, there's no work to do in this module. However, what you should be doing is working on your Earth timeline project. In other words, the material which I presented to you this far and which is available in Life's Rocky Start, Brian Cox's video, you know, as well as the book, The Story of Earth, up to Red Earth should be used to start producing your timeline. Take this time to produce that timeline up to this point. And therefore you will learn it well and get ready for the module quiz, which is coming at you, okay? Additionally, in the assignments right below this one, the introductory stuff, you're going to see examples of timelines, several average ones and some very good ones too. So you can use those to help boot you, you know, off into the right direction. And of course there's me too. Always rely on me if you want to show me what you've done so far, I'd be happy to give you pointers on what you're doing. You can tell me what your goals are. If you want an absolute, hey, I'll show you how to get to that direction, how to really enrich it for you to make a great learning experience and something you can be proud of. All right. So I'll see you guys next week. I hope this, uh, this lecture has been at least somewhat helpful for you um, and um, revealing. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, end this right now.